with some of the thoughts we began, brothers and sisters, the first class with. We can look to the mind of the psalmist. And as he prayed many times for help from Yahweh in deliverance in his time of need, there was a mindset on the psalmist as he approached the Father, brothers and sisters. And it is why the Father heard him. Because when he approached them in prayer, this was what his mind was focused upon. Even in his time of dire need and his struggles and in depression, and he saw no hope and he was begging for help, there was this mind found in Psalm 6, brothers and sisters. It's a scripture we know as Christadelphians teaches a sound doctrine for us, but it also shows us where our mind should be, brothers and sisters, in Psalm 6 and in the fifth verse, as he prayed for deliverance, brothers and sisters. Deliver my soul, he says in verse 4. Save me for thy mercy's sake, for in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? He pleaded to the Father, saying, I can't give glory and honor unto you if I'm in the grave. If I die, I can't praise you. I can't manifest you. And so this was with the basis he pleaded to Yahweh. He realized the purpose of his life was to give glory and honor unto his father. And if he wasn't delivered and he died, there would be one less who could glorify his name. What a mindset to have, brothers and sisters, in all of our troubles and as we go through our life. We must remember why we're here. And it's to glorify him, brothers and sisters. This must constantly be on our mind when we wake up, when we approach our Heavenly Father in prayer, when we ask for anything, when we're asking for food. It should be because we want to use the strength from that food to bring glory and honor unto his name. When we're asking for deliverance or assistance, whatever it may be, it may be so that we may become healthy again to give glory and honor unto his name if we're sick. Everything is based upon this principle in our lives, brothers and sisters. We must approach him, brothers and sisters, with this mindset. It is so far gone in the world, it's not even seen. We realize our lives aren't about us. It's about bringing glory and honor unto him. Let this always be in our mind, brothers and sisters, when we approach our Heavenly Father for anything. And we know David and his sin, when he prayed, he said, my sin is ever before me, brothers and sisters. There was a self-examination spirit when he prayed. And we need to have this, brothers and sisters, when we approach our Heavenly Father. For example, brothers and sisters, speaking of myself, if I'm having trouble in my marriage and I pray to God for help, but what really needs to happen, brothers and sisters, if I'm treating my wife inappropriately, I need to look at myself. That's the problem. I haven't looked to the Scriptures. And this is why there's a problem in the marriage, because I'm not acting correctly. And so when we ask our Father for assistance and for guidance, let's make sure we're examining ourselves. Because the problem may be us not turning to the Word and changing our character. And so that's something we need to have, brothers and sisters, when we're asking our Heavenly Father for help. We're in a difficult situation. We may be the problem, because we're not submitting to the Word of God. And so once again, brothers and sisters, it's that spirit of self-examination, looking at self. And the flesh doesn't want to do that. We'll be in problems many times. We'll say, why is this happening? Or it's this person's fault or that person's fault. It very well could be us, brothers and sisters. So let us have our sin ever before us and look at ourselves, brothers and sisters. This is well pleasing to our Heavenly Father when we approach Him in prayer. And David finds himself, brothers and sisters, and He needs to flee Jerusalem. His son that he loves so dearly, brothers and sisters, is after his life. And how could David possibly bear this, brothers and sisters? More trial, more suffering, more pressure through the hands of his own child. It just seems too much, brothers and sisters. It just seems too much. And it is for the natural man. The natural man cannot bear these things. But the spiritual man can endure them, brothers and sisters. 
because he realizes, as we've been speaking about, it's something he needs. He can't understand it. It's hard to go through. It's difficult. It can be mental torture at times, brothers and sisters, and physically if we're sick, but he realizes, I need this. And we turn to Psalm 119, brothers and sisters, for a few thoughts that are on the psalmist's mind, even through the worst times. That's why we must always turn to the word, brothers and sisters. It gives such guidance. And in Psalm 119, brothers and sisters, in the 67th verse of Psalm 119, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. This is how he was taught the word of God. And he went away from doing that which was wrong in the eyes of Yahweh. The affliction was a tool. It was a teaching tool by God. And he, need, he knew without this affliction, he wasn't going to learn God's word. And so we need it, brothers and sisters. It's not just reading the scriptures and studying them, which is vital. He has to blend in affliction so we can apply the word to our lives and grow by it. And so we need to understand that, brothers and sisters, that we need this affliction. It's a way of him teaching us, brothers and sisters. In the 71st verse, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. He saw this as a teaching tool, brothers and sisters, in affliction. And when we're sick, we're going through a temptation, a trial, a struggle. Do we see it in this fashion? We must realize I'm being taught. And if we apply God's word to that trial we're going through, we will learn, brothers and sisters. The law of thy mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver. And it says, brothers and sisters, in that 75th verse, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. Our God is faithful, brothers and sisters. He's never going to do too much. He's going to crush us. He's never going to put us in a situation where it's just going to destroy us and we're going to walk away from the truth. He does it in faithfulness because he knows I love my servant. They need this. And I'm faithful to this brother or sister, my son or my daughter. So I'm going to put them through this because I know this is good for them, even though it will be suffering. This should give us strength, brothers and sisters, when going through anything, any trial, any suffering. At times, brothers and sisters, we're not faithful. He's always faithful. And so we need to have confidence in whatever we're going through. This is for our good. It's because he loves me. He wants to teach me. He wants me to learn. He knows I need this. And so this is such a source of comfort, brothers and sisters, when we are going through any trial. And we turn, brothers and sisters, to Hebrews chapter 12, real quick. This is a theme that runs through the scriptures. And it should lift us up in time of trial, brothers and sisters. Hebrews 12, verse 5. And he had forgotten the exhortation. They had forgotten this, brothers and sisters. They were getting down in the Hebrew ecclesia. The pressures and the trials were becoming too much because they forgot this principle, which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure the chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? For ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers. Then are ye bastards and not sons. And so this, brothers and sisters, as he says in the 11th verse, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So it's all about our mindset, brothers and sisters. We can go through a trial, and it might just bring us down, gets us depressed, we become bitter, we're just aggravated. But if we see it as Yahweh teaching us, purging our character, as it says, those which are exercised thereby. We need to have a teachable, childlike spirit when we're going through trials, when we're going through struggles. Because we want to be exercised by it, not just brought down and become bitter by it. 
And so it all goes back to that mindset, brothers and sisters, of having faith in God, that He is faithful, and whatever we're going through is for our good. But we need to be exercised by it, brothers and sisters. And that's why He says, lift up the hands which hang down in the feeble knees. We need to bear ourselves together, brothers and sisters. He's on our side. We need these trials that produce those fruits of righteousness that will give glory and honor unto Him. He's teaching us, brothers and sisters, through trial and temptation and through struggles. And this is what the psalmist saw, so he could endure them. And as it says, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. It's a tough experience, brothers and sisters. It's not enjoyable, but at the very end result, we can be taught. And we can bring glory and honor unto our Heavenly Father. Let's always try to keep this mindset, brothers and sisters, whether we're going through struggles with our, struggles with our children, or it could be a marriage or our brothers and sisters or something at work financially. Let us have faith, brothers and sisters. It is for our good and to produce fruits of righteousness, brothers and sisters, unto our Heavenly Father. And really humbling, brothers and sisters, once again, Hebrews chapter 5, speaking of the Son, brothers and sisters, though he were a son, yet he learned in the eighth verse obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect, brothers and sisters. The son learned obedience by the things which he suffered. He was taught by the father. What of us, brothers and sisters? Look what the son went through. What can we expect? Any less of ourselves, brothers and sisters? We need to go through things. We need to learn obedience. We need to be taught these things by the father. So, brothers and sisters, let us keep our faith in our God. We are going through these times of trial, through these times of struggles, brothers and sisters. But if we're not taking in the word of God daily, brothers and sisters, we'll not be able to withstand anything. We're going to fold. We're going to crack. We're not going to learn anything from what we're going through. The word is the basis, the foundation. It lets us understand and comprehend why we're enduring something. And by trials, brothers and sisters, I don't always mean something big and major in our life. Everyday life is a trial. To get up and act correctly in your marriage, act correctly when you go to work, raising children correctly in the home, acting correctly in the ecclesia. These are all trials, brothers and sisters. Normal, everyday life. And as we talk to our brothers and sisters, we may technically get through something. We may get through our day. But were we exercised by it, brothers and sisters? Was it a day to build up our faith? To build up our character? That's how we should see every single day. That's what the psalmist did. He saw it as an opportunity to bring glory and honor unto his Father. And I know it's hard, brothers and sisters, but it's not just plow through a day mindlessly and we just get through it and we're home and, you know. Let's try to have a thoughtful day that brings glory and honor unto our Heavenly Father. That's what each day should be. It should have meaning. Even in the menial things of life, there's opportunity to glorify Him. And that's how we have to view our lives, brothers and sisters. And it gives it meaning, the only meaning to a life. Glory and honor unto our Heavenly Father. And we read back in Psalm 119, brothers and sisters. You saw the importance of the word, brothers and sisters, the psalmist. Scripture we know very well, of course, Psalm 119, in verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And this was the lampstand in the tabernacle, brothers and sisters, in the holy place. Oil was taken and would give light to something that was normally pitch black. This was the lighting source that came from inside that holy place. And if we turn back, brothers and sisters, to Leviticus chapter 24 in relation, relation to this quickly. Leviticus chapter 24, in the first verse, in relation to this, what the psalmist is speaking of, this lampstand that gave light. So it was dark inside, brothers and sisters, the holy place. The priest couldn't minister. He needed that light source from that lampstand to light it up so he could then go around and minister and give service unto Yahweh. Without that lampstand, darkness. He can't see what he's doing. He can't minister. He can't minister for the people, for his brothers and sisters, and he can't minister to bring glory and honor unto his God. 
So in Leviticus chapter 24, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying in the first verse, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil olive beaten for the light to cause the lamps to burn continually. Without the veil of the testimony in the holy place, in the tabernacle of the congregation shall Aaron order it from the evening unto the morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a statue forever in your generation. This light was needed and it was the responsibility of the children of Israel, everyone in the ecclesia, to gather that olive oil together and bring it so it could be used to light up for the priest so he could minister inside of the holy place. So the responsibility is on us, brothers and sisters. We owe it to our ecclesia, to our brothers and sisters, to our families and to our God to gather up that olive oil. And so what are we doing, brothers and sisters, with this word? How much do we gather of it? To bring that olive oil to light up our homes, to light up our ecclesias, to give us light as we go throughout our day in the world. Because if it's just a casual grabbing of the Bible and reading it, we close it, and we think that's enough, brothers and sisters, it's not for me, I know that. It's how much we squeeze out of this word for the olive oil. It's going to give us light in our homes, in our marriages, in our relationships, in our ecclesias as we go about our day. And so we need to see how vital this word is, brothers and sisters. And you're going to get what you put into it. If you're just going to casually read a few pages or a couple of chapters and close it, now you can go about doing the things you really want to do with your day. Well, you're not going to have much light. You're not going to have much guidance on what to do in life. And it will go out, brothers and sisters, if you don't feed that lampstand. And so we need to understand that, brothers and sisters, and the vitalness of lighting up our lives with this word of God. It'll get us through trials. It'll get us through struggles. We'll have guidance throughout our day, each and every day. But every day, brothers and sisters, that lampstand had to burn, and it needed that fuel. And it's the responsibility of the ecclesia, brothers and sisters, and brothers and sisters individually, to bring that source of light. And brothers and sisters, I know of myself, you go to a study day, or you come to meeting on Sunday, or you're reading the Word, and you have that kind of thought process where you say, I need to change, I need to do more for the Word of God, I need to do more in the truth, I need to study more. But then you leave meeting, and you leave the Bible school, and you go back to your regular old self again, your regular old routine. And let's try, brothers and sisters, to have that principle that is brought out in 2 Corinthians, brothers and sisters. To not let it be that way, brothers and sisters. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I know we all want to do better. We want to do more in the study of the word and what we do in the truth. And there's a principle found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And in the 11th verse, Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. I know we all want, brothers and sisters, and say, we're going to do more, we're going to do better. And then it stops at that many times, brothers and sisters. I know in my own life it does. But let's perform, brothers and sisters, that will, that urge we had to do more. Let's stop at having it just be something we're going to do in the future. We need to start now reading the word more, studying the word more, doing more for our brothers and sisters, praying more. Let's not just have that feeling that we want to do it and the thought that it's going to happen one day. Let's do it, brothers and sisters. In relation to David, brothers and sisters, a few more thoughts. We see the type in relation to Christ. Just real quickly turning to John. John chapter 18. In the first verse, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron. And there was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples, brothers and sisters. And if we turn back to 2 Samuel, brothers and sisters, with that in mind, Christ passing with his disciples over the brook Kidron. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, brothers and sisters, and in the 23rd verse of 2 Samuel 15, and all the country wept with a loud voice. And all the people passed over. The king also himself passed over the brook Kidron. 
And all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. And in the 30th verse, And David went up by the ascent of Mount Olivet, and wept as he went up, and had his head covered, and he went barefoot. And all the people that was with him covered every man his head, and they went up, weeping as they went up. And so we see the mindset, brothers and sisters, of David as he poured his emotions out unto his heavenly Father. And we know what the Son went through, brothers and sisters, as he poured out his soul unto his heavenly Father in great despair. And brothers, our emotions are very important. It's a very vital part of our worship to our heavenly Father. And we see David's emotion here as he poured himself out. And we know from the Psalms it was a crying unto God for help. He was heartbroken at what his son was doing to him and the situation he was in. And we know under the law, brothers and sisters, when the insides of the animal were laid out, the kidneys, brothers and sisters, for an an example, was laid upon the offering. It was the feelings of the individual they were offering unto Yahweh. And so our emotions, brothers and sisters, must be given unto God. And it's pleasing to him when we do that, brothers and sisters. But what of the world, brothers and sisters? There's things in the world that can spark emotion in us. As we've spoken about worldly music, can create that fake little emotion inside of us, one way or the other. Is that being offered unto Yahweh? Hollywood with its movies, they watch us and they try to get us feeling a certain way, brothers and sisters. Is that being offered to Yahweh? No. And there's many things, brothers, sporting events and all these things of the world office. They want to get an emotion out of us so that we get into it. We get into what they have to offer. Brothers and sisters, our emotions are reserved for Yahweh, nobody else. He gets our emotions. And are we giving them unto him, brothers and sisters? Are they being offered unto him? And they're offered unto him, brothers, when we give our emotions to each other. That's an offering unto Yahweh, brothers and sisters. When we give give them to our families. But he's jealous of our emotions, brothers and sisters, and he deserves them. Let's not give our emotions to the world and things that have no profit. And that's a point of self-examination, brothers and sisters. Where are we giving our emotions to? We know where Christ was giving his emotions to. We know where David was giving his emotions to as he cried out. They were to the Heavenly Father, to our Heavenly Father, brothers and sisters. And we know all emotions should go unto him, brothers and sisters, from joy can be offered unto him. Sadness, brothers and sisters, can be offered unto him. And even we look at Lot, brothers and sisters. This is important as well. A scripture that was brought to my attention. In 1 Peter, brothers and sisters, in 2 Peter, actually, 2 Peter chapter 2, speaking of Lot, in turning, in the sixth verse of 2 Peter 2, in turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them examples unto those that after should live ungodly. In delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy lifestyles of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. This is the feeling when he saw the wickedness of the world around him. And this was an emotion offered unto Yahweh. When we see the wickedness of man, brothers and sisters, are we just numb to it? It's become so commonplace or if we're taking in the things of the world... Maybe it just seems normal to us, brothers and sisters. We should be vexed, brothers and sisters. We should have such a zeal for Yahweh. As Christ, it says, he loved righteousness and he hated iniquity. Hatred has its place, brothers and sisters. And we should hate iniquity and wickedness. Or do we look around at this world, brothers and sisters, and the evil acts being done and the godless lives, and we just, has no real effect on us. We become numb to it. We want to be vexed, brothers and sisters. We should be. There should be something that's offered unto Yahweh because we have a zeal for him. But the more we spend taking in the things of the world, brothers and sisters, and away from the word, we'll become numb to it. And so let us be circumspect, brothers and sisters, with our emotions. And as we know, brothers and sisters, as Christ went and prayed, it's interesting, it says, without turning to the scripture, he was a stone's throw away from his disciples when he prayed in his great time of agony. 
And as we know of Shimei, brothers and sisters, as he threw the stones at David, as he walked along and pelted him and his men with them. And we know, brothers and sisters, why David was having those stones thrown at him. But why was Christ having these things done to him, brothers and sisters? He had no personal sin, brothers and sisters. He didn't morally sin. Yet he was enduring these things, brothers and sisters. And it's a trait we need to have, brothers and sisters. We read in 1 Peter, as David endured those rocks being thrown at him, as Christ endured the things he went through, being beaten and slapped and tortured and put to death. We need to have the same type of spirit, brothers and sisters. Not one that asserts ourselves. We read in 1 Peter chapter 2, in the 20th verse, For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? And David was pelted because he had done some great sin, brothers and sisters. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. We need to develop the spirit, brothers and sisters. We need to be like Christ. Now is the age of the Lamb, brothers and sisters. When we're out in the world, when we're going about in the ecclesia, when we're going about whatever it may be at our place of work, we need to suffer wrong, brothers and sisters. Even when we didn't do anything wrong, possibly. We don't assert ourselves and get somebody back and they did this to us. Wrong, brothers and sisters. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to take it patiently, brothers and sisters. Even when we don't deserve it. Because that fellowship's what Christ did, brothers and sisters. And it lives out those emblems that we remembered in, in him this morning. And so this has to be a spirit we have, brothers and sisters. We know in the world, let's get somebody back. They did something to me. Even in small situations like traffic, brothers and sisters. We need to submit. And suffer wrong at times. In the smallest areas to the largest areas, brothers and sisters. And because of time, brothers and sisters, um, in closing... When could David come back, brothers and sisters? When could he come back to Jerusalem and reign as king? When will Christ, brothers and sisters, come back? Well, we see an obstacle to David's reign was that body of sin, sin's flesh, seen in type in his son Absalom. And as he hung from that tree, brothers and sisters, dead, it was sin's flesh, the body of sin, that serpent, Swinging there and sitting dead and still. And so David could return, brothers and sisters. And we know our Lord and Master has put that to death in himself, brothers and sisters. Absalom and all his glory and his pride and his outward appearance, all the things that symbol the flesh, were put to death, brothers and sisters, by our Lord and Savior. Let us follow him and wait patiently for his return.